Hey YouTube, this is Mike and I just wanted to share a short little snippet from this episode that I really enjoyed. However, if you want to listen to the full episode, either scroll down this post or head to mikejamesreed.com forward slash podcast for the full episode. Thanks and enjoy. What are some of the dichotomies that, that come up for you that you've really come to a junction at, at different points in your life? And talk us through it and you know how did you navigate it so the first one that immediately springs to mind was when we were living in zurich and uh i was very happy to stay on my wife wanted to move back to canada and i got a job offer from my biggest client which was a really really like proverbial offer you can't refuse and i remember thinking okay there's no way kate's going to want to do this she wants to go back understand that what can I do? How can I figure out and make this work? And so I was a little bit devious. I knew that I was going to be phoned at home by the CFO of the company who was offering me this job. I knew I was going to be phoned at home this particular evening. So I invited a friend round for dinner <laughs> on the basis that I could take the call and my wife would be busy chatting with him. And then, and then you know, she couldn't get mad at me because there was someone, <laughs> someone else there. <laughs> masterful, masterful. <laughs> And then, you know, we then got into deeper discussions about it. And, uh, you know, initially it was like, okay, we'll give it a year. And then I got a promotion after a year and we ended up staying in Switzerland. So I, we went to Switzerland and I had a two-year contract. We ended up staying there nearly six years. And then I got the opportunity to move to London and my wife's mom lives in the UK and we had two young children then. So for both of us, it was just a complete no-brainer to move here. And we've, we've been here 26 years now. So when you were wanting to move to... Zurich, and you knew that Kate wouldn't be so up for the idea? No, to stay in Zurich. We were already there. Sorry, beg your pardon, to stay. So talk us through sort of kind of at that time when you were feeling conflicted about it. What were some of the tools that you, you drew upon to you know, better navigate that or even have that difficult conversation at the time? At that time in my life, I would have taken a very rational approach to it. I would have said, look, here are the you know, here are the financial benefits. I mean, I was looking at a 40% pay rise. So it was like, you know, look at all the things we can do. Look at all the traveling we can do. It was actually really interesting because my wife had always wanted to have a family and we, we thought, well, we're going to Switzerland for two years so we won't have kids. And I remember one of the things she said was, okay, well, if we stay, I want to have kids. And so I said, great, let's have kids. So both of our daughters ended up being born in Switzerland. And this was at what age? The first one was born when I was 28, and the second one was born when I was 30. Okay. And the other day when we were catching up for coffee, you said you got married at 20... 21. 21. And you also said that you wanted to live to 100 and... At least 101. At least 101. So that Kate and I can celebrate our 80th wedding anniversary. Phenomenal. Yeah. Tell us more about how, why you decided that. What was, when did that goal come about, and, and why did it come about? So that goal came about... In the summer of 2014, we were on holiday in Canada. Interestingly, by that stage, I had read two of Dan's books, Entrepreneur Revolution and Key Person of Influence. So I was already kind of in that bit of a thought mode. And I was also starting to read some more sort of spiritually minded books. And one in particular that I was very into that summer was a book called Manifesting Change by a guy called Mike Dooley. I don't know if you've ever come across that. The interesting thing is Mike Dooley is a chartered accountant. Well, he's, he's a CPA because he's American, but he's a chartered accountant who trained with PwC and then went and worked overseas. And I met him in London at an event of his a couple of years ago and spoke with him. He and I were at PwC at exactly the same time. And he has this book called Manifesting Change, and it was all about envisioning the future that you want. And it was a sunny summer afternoon. We were staying at my wife's dad's place. She and her dad were out on a walk or something, and I was just sitting on their back porch, probably had a couple of beers, and just thought, okay, what do I want? And I, and I came up with two life goals, and one of them was to live to be 101 and celebrate our 80th wedding anniversary, and I totally accept that I'm only half of that equation, so that also means I have to act in ways that are congruent with a, a long-lasting marriage so that, you know, hopefully Kate will stick around too. And the other life goal I came up was that, um, you know, once I knew that, know that my family's financially looked after and I've got my number, I intend to give everything else away. 
And that's very much thinking that came out of some of the reading I did on Dent Stuff and the whole link to the UN Global Goals. Okay, so I've got a couple of follow-up questions to that. How long has the marriage been so far? 35 years last August. Incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. I asked you this the other day, and I'd, I'd love, if you're open to it, sharing with me again. What do you feel are the ingredients to a successful, long-lasting relationship? Love, above all else, honesty, truth, even when it's hard, being open, sharing time together, but also having time on your own, because I've seen lots of older couples where one of them dies and the other one just decides life's not worth living anymore. And it's really interesting that seeing my mum, who's about to turn 90, and my dad died six and a half years ago. In fact, today is his 90, would have been his 92nd birthday. And my mum never gave up. And my mum is still going strong. And I think that's so important. But it's interesting because my mum and dad had their lives together and they had their own individual lives as well. And I think that's a critical thing for relationships. How do you foster that? Because I think that's the thing that you know I agree with wholeheartedly. But then sometimes I'm not exactly sure what's the best way to create that you know, separation while maintaining that closeness at the same time. Well, you and I have the advantage that, you know, we work for a really cool organization and so we can spend a lot of our time and attention and efforts there. And so automatically, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we have the ability to step into that role, which is mm. separate. I mean, my wife's a teacher, so, you know, she's got a full-time job as well. So she's got that. She's her own community of friends associated with that. So it's like already there kind of. And then, you know, I look at our friends and, and this is an interesting one for people who've always lived in the same place. They won't understand this, but we grew up in on the West Coast of Canada and then we moved to Switzerland and then we moved to the UK. So we've still got very, very close friends in each of those places, but we don't necessarily have, say, the group of friends that you went to school with that you see all the time or the people that you were at uni with. And, and so we've kind of had to establish sets of friends and when we moved to the UK, it was great for Kate because she had the kids and having kids just automatically opens conversations when you're down at the playground with other parents of kids. And so most of her good friends are people that she met through the kids. Most of my good friends are people that I met through work. And then we have half a dozen couple friends as well. 